if we had a a project okay and everybody had to uh to try to command attention from tony robbins in the group there was like 1500 people there and we had to try to 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 do a group project to command the most attention okay so i was part of a group and there just wasn't much energy in it and uh and i met a girl by the name of marion remember marion yeah. bader and uh and so in the hallway we conducted what you call a merger of our groups okay and when we merged our groups we had now twice as many people twice as many ideas and uh and it put us in a position to do very well well the whole time i was there i was trying to network with tony robbins because i wanted to get on that stage well i made a lot of noise at that event and um and as it would turn out you know all kinds of people just started coming up and introducing themselves to me and scott was one of them and I thought Scott worked for Tony, and so I was working Scott <laughs> to try to get me where I wanted to be, right? And, uh, you know, and, and that's just the way it goes. And so, you know, what's interesting is that, um, you know, Scott talked a little bit about my accident. I'm going to share with you some things today that I think can really help you, okay? Because, you know, it doesn't take going through a tragedy, and that's what I really learned. It doesn't take going through a tragedy to uh, apply some of the principles that we're going to talk about today. Okay, see, the principles that we're going to talk about are, are, are very basic things. Uh, defining a problem, okay, very basic things. Sometimes you have to define a problem because you're going to create a solution. Isn't that what we do in business? Is, isn't business all about defining a problem and then creating a solution to address that problem? Okay, well, isn't life also about, you know, sometimes you're faced with a problem and how we're going to really overcome that problem. See, the way that I learned these strategies is basically by dealing with so much adversity that you end up understanding and figuring out that, wow, if I don't have to deal with adversity, I could use this to just accomplish anything I want to in my life, okay? So on October 31st, 1987, I was 12 years old. And I have a good friend of mine, Rana, who we went to high school together. She probably remembers this day. Um, I was playing Pop Warner football uh, for the New North Hill Redskins, and uh, I was a tailback and a linebacker, and football in my family was everything, okay? Uh, my Uncle Ricky played for the Cincinnati Bengals. My Uncle Tony was the director of player scouting for the San, San Francisco 49ers from 1977 to 1991, and we played at a stadium named uh, Tigert Stadium, and Tigert Stadium in western Pennsylvania is like, uh, has more lore than any NFL field. Okay, because we won all kinds of championships. We were the, one of the top high school programs for 70 years running. In fact, Paul Brown, which a lot of you may have heard of, uh, played against Newcastle and lost his first game against Newcastle by my head coach, at the time was a player, throwing a touchdown pass to beat them 7-0. Okay, so there was a lot of lore in being able to play under the lights of Taggart Stadium, and this was my first time. And so it was a big night in my life, right? Well... My mother had a business, and she went down to take care of her business, and, uh, and I was 12 years old. I was going to play at a friend's house. Well, when we got there, you know, we figured out, hey, my mom's not home, okay? So let's go back to where my mother's, it, 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 to my house. That way we could do what we want to do. Well, on the way, we ran into a bunch of older kids who were riding quad bikes, right? And they were hanging out in the woods, and they were sniffing gas out of the gas tank. Okay, well, that's something that I never saw anyone do and I never thought about doing before. But on this date, on this time, they said, hey, listen, why don't you guys sniff gas with us? I did it. Big mistake. Well, we had nothing that really bad happened, but we went back to my house. When we got to the garage, to my house, we went into the garage and, uh, and my buddy was like, hey, let's sniff gas again. Well, we did. Big mistake, right? And what ends up happening is he has a pack of matches and he starts flicking the matches okay, not knowing any better, and the next thing you know, around my ankle, my, my pants caught on fire, okay, and I jumped up, and I'll never forget, I jumped up, and the, and the pain was just horrendous, and, and I'll never forget trying to get the, the fire off my leg, okay, and as I put the fire out, there was like a magnetic force that came with the fire, and it just can, it continued to rage back up, and uh, it caught on the wrist of my, my, uh, my jacket, and I put my, jet, my hand in my pocket, and the next thing you know, my jacket melted around my hand. Well, I'm trying to get out of the garage because the kid who was in there with me shut the garage door, 
and now I'm on fire up to my, my waist. And I'm trying to get out, and I keep pushing the garage door to get it out, and I put my left hand on the window. What well, was so hot, it burned an imprint of my le left hand into the window. And I fell back on these bottles that my, my dad made wine. I had these giant bottles, and those bottles exploded because the heat was so intense. So finally, I pulled the door open, and when I pulled the door open, the oxygen from the outside hit, and all of a sudden, I was a ball of flames. Okay? And I stood there with the flames crackling around me, and I felt it on my ears and coming up my head, and I could smell it. And my neighbor, Mary Ryan, was standing there and said, roll, roll, roll. Well, for one reason or another, I wasn't afraid at any time. I did not panic. I wasn't crying. I wasn't... I was, just in, I was just on fire, okay? I was a ball of flames. So I rolled, and as I rolled, my other neighbor, Mr. Hartman and Mrs. Hartman, saw me out the back window. Can you imagine what they would have thought? You know, they looked out their back window, and all of a sudden they see this boy on fire that's just ball of flames crackling. Envision that. They ran outside and got an, uh, an army blanket, and as I rolled, in a few seconds, they, they had the army blanket, they covered me with the army blanket, and the next thing you know, the fire was out. So, I mean, so really think about how quickly life can change. Think about how quickly life can change. So, one second, I'm getting ready for a Pop Warner championship ball game. This is going to be the greatest night of my life. The next minute, I made one decision, one isolated decision, and all of a sudden, I'm on what is called to be my deathbed. So here's what I want to think about. Here's what I want you to consider. Here's what I want you to really take from that. If you can make one decision that can cost you everything, isn't it true that you could make one decision that can get you everything? Now think about that. Because if you could make one decision in your life, and that one decision could set you on fire, could change the course of your life forever, then can you make one decision in business that could set the business on fire and set the business up forever? Why not? See, here's the point. As I laid on, that, on the ground, there was a lot of things that could have happened to me right there, okay? But Mr. Hartman called the 911, and 911 was there in a, a few moments. And when they got there, they could have done a lot of different things to me, right? They could have done things that could have cost me my life. They could have got, done things that could have saved my life. What they did was immediately they put an IV in my neck. See, what people don't realize about burn patients is that burn patients most often when they have injuries to the degree of mine from their neck to their ankles, They'll die of dehydration because your skin is what keeps your water in your body. And so when they put me on the gurney and pulled me up, literally gallons of water fell out of my system onto the ground. But what had happened is that the, water, that the IV that they put in my neck and started, was replenishing the water so my vital organs didn't shut down. Again, think about that for a moment. If he would not have put that IV in my neck, what would have happened? I'd have died. Now think about that and how it plays into your life and your business and your job here. You are also a paramedic, so to speak, for your clients. Your clients are coming to you for solutions because their businesses need some help. And you're a paramedic. You're the person who needs to understand what it is that is that decision point, what it is that you need to do right now to help that business survive and thrive. You can either make the decision to worry and just get this kid to the hospital, where if you don't do anything, that, that business could fail. They could waste their money and not have a great impression of your business. Or you could put that IV in because you know it's the right thing to do because you're cool, calm, and collected. You can make a decision under fire. You are the paramedic. You are the person with the blanket. That's who you are. And you need to look at that thinking all the time. Because when I went to the hospital, I went to Jameson Memorial Hospital, again, never cried, never upset, asking if I could play football that night. They brought me into the, they brought me into the emergency room, 
And the nurses immediately came out with these big tables with giant blocks of ice, okay? And, they, and they're rolling the ice into the room. And this little oriental doctor named Dr. Cairo Lipio, okay? Dr. Cairo Lipio came in and he stood before my bed and goes, no, 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 no. Well, why? Because I burned it over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And if they would have taken those blocks of ice and put them on my body, the change in temperature from being burned over a thousand degrees to being below freezing would have caused hypothermia in my system. And what would have happened? I'd have died. So it took Dr. Kyrolipio understanding that the, that would occur. It took that understanding to stop. So in business, when you're a manager and you have an employee and they're looking at you and they're wanting to do what they think was right. See, the nurses didn't think that they were doing the wrong thing by packing me in ice. But when you're a manager and you understand a little bit of more complexity of the situation, you have a responsibility not to enable the people who work for you to do the wrong thing. Great lesson. Now, do you think that those nurses got offended or upset? that the doctor said no not to pack with the ice? Well, someone might have, if they're a difficult person to manage. Or do you think that they learned a lesson as to how to treat burn patients? See, dealing with your management team, dealing with people who are, are very new, they're going to have things, they're gonna, there's going to be reasons that, that they want to do the things that they do because they, they have a desire to do things the right way. See, but as managers, as business leaders, as people who are in charge, we are looking for a desired result. We have an objective and a responsibility to teach the people who work for us the right way rather than enable them to do the wrong thing which yields a negative result. Being a manager is somebody who has responsibility. Being a manager is somebody who knows the way, who's guided, who has experience. And you have to be able to lead people so that they trust your judgment, so that they trust what you're going to do. Because guess what? This kid was sitting here on this hospital bed, and what happens? If I was packed with ice, I would have died. If there wasn't a good manager there, the project wouldn't have went well. And guess what? If the project didn't go well, I would have just been one, another one of those statistics of people who had 0% chance to survive. But the truth is, it would have been because a manager didn't step up and do what was right. Very, very powerful thought. Now, in addition to that, my parents come to the, come to the room. Okay? And there was a, a doctor, Dr. Lamakusa, who's a female doctor, and my mother's mother had just passed away in, in late July of 87. And when my mother's mother passed away, Dr. Lamakusa went up to her and said, Janet, you need to go in this room, and I got a volume for you. Okay? Well, what do you think that Dr. Lamakusa said the day I was burned? She said, Janet, you need to go in this room, and I got a volume for you. So immediately, my mother thought the worst. And I laid there on that bed. They couldn't put anything on me. I was, I was naked on that bed, just, just burned. And, uh, and my mother comes into the room. And when she came into the room, see, I never cried this whole time. I was okay with feeling the pain that I had to feel, okay? But when I saw the look on my mother's face, I immediately cried and said, I'm sorry. Well, my mother said, like an actress, you don't have to be sorry. Everything's going to be okay. And she came up and she kissed me on my forehead and made me feel that everything was going to be all right. And just then, my father came into the room and he looked at me and I asked, I didn't cry when I saw my dad. He asked, I asked him, I said, Dad, am I going to have to get anything amputated? I looked at my hand and it was obviously very bad. And my dad said, we're not interested in saving your hand, Anthony. We're interested in saving your life. And I'm going to tell you right now, you could count on my words. We're all going to walk out of here together. Now, I want you to really consider that as a leader, as a business owner, as somebody who 
can influence the thoughts in the direction of a team. Because what happened right there is the Pygmalion effect, the, the idea that somebody believed that I believed in and I trusted told me it was going to be okay and I believed them. They instituted a thought that even though it doesn't look good, we're going to be all right. And I believed in them and I trusted them. My mother forgave me and kissed me on my forehead, which allowed me to eliminate any guilt that I may have had for the circumstance. My father made me believe in him that we were going to be all right. And so regardless of what those doctors said or how bad it looked, when we're leaders and things don't look great, we have a responsibility to dig deep in our belief system and figure out a way to influence and inspire the people who are around us to let them believe that because our vision is so powerful and so strong that we will not be denied and that we can overcome any adversity together. That's what we do as leaders. That's what we do when we're setting out on a mission. It's not the level of, of obstacle that is before us. Rather, it is our decision to climb those obstacles together that will make a difference. And somebody has to be that decision maker. Somebody has to be the person who's leading us through that. In that case, it was my father. You never know who it's going to be. Because when the leader gets ill, it may be the janitor in the room. You never know who it's going to be. So we all have to find that pit in our stomach, that desire, that drive, that ability to see beyond our current circumstance to where we're going to be. So I was life flighted to West Penn Hospital. And, uh, and when I got to West Penn Hospital, they immediately put me in emergency surgery. Okay. Now, here's what's very interesting. When they put me in emergency surgery, they gave me 25 milligrams of morphine, 25 milligrams of Valium. Well, that's enough morphine and Valium to knock out a horse, okay? But I had so much energy and life in me that they could not get me to stop, okay? Because they had to do some terrible things. They have to debreed your burns. And what that means is they take, they take basic iron brushes and they scrape down your burn injuries to the point where they bleed. And then they take a scalpel over them to take off the dead burn. Because if they don't, what will happen is that, is that you'll develop gangrene and infection and you'll die. While I was fighting so hard, there, there was a former uh, NFL ball player nose tackle from the Pittsburgh Steelers who's, who now worked in the burn unit. They had to get him to lay on my chest to calm my arms down. And at 12 years old, I lifted him off my chest. Okay. He was a 250-pound guy. And I still find it to be interesting. And, but the doctor said at that moment that he knew if anyone had a chance to survive this accident, it would be me. Because I had that fight. Well, after that, I had to go through every single day, three times a day, that debreeding exercise. And, and so when my parents get there, they get to the, the hospital room and they put them immediately in a conference room where the medical staff went in and said to them, I need you to make funeral arrangements. And my mother wasn't buying it. My, they said, look, if he lives through the night, he will die in three days. And if he lives for three days, he will die in three weeks of infection. These are national statistics. Make the funeral arrangements now. Well, my mother's a little Italian lady, and she looked up at uh, Dr. Slater, who was one of the greatest doctors in the country, and she said, you don't have to be so brutally honest with me. And Dr. Slater looked back at her, said, I'm not being br brutally honest with you. If I was being brutally honest with you, I'd tell you the truth. Your son has a snowball's chance in hell to survive. That's what he said. Pretty nice, right? Well, my mom stood up and cracked him right in the face. Okay, don't you talk. You cannot take my hope. She said to him, cracked him right in the face. Well, 
you know, true to word, I made it through the night. Uh, I made it through three days. And then three weeks into the, to my hospital stay, my heart rate was beating at 189 beats a minute. My blood pressure was 49 over 20. My temperature rose to 106 degrees. And, uh, and the medical staff go to my parents and say, look, there's nothing more we could do. They put me on a drug called Pavulon, which was a self-induced coma. There's nothing more we could do other than make them comfortable. Well, my whole family gathered, and they all came in from Newcastle, and there was a vigil outside of my room. And Father Morrow, who was a, a priest from our local church, brought this little lady who just got back from the Holy Land, okay? She was wearing a red babushka, okay? And she had oil. And that night, my mother and my father, my Aunt Betty, my Uncle Bobby, and, and the little old lady stayed in my room, and they packed ice under my neck, on my wrist, and on my ankles. Well, the little old lady sat and kneeled before my, my bed in prayer, and she stayed there from 11 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning. Never moved. She anointed me. At 6 o'clock in the morning, she looked at my mother. She stood up, didn't say a word all night, looked at my mother, gave her a hug, said, your boy's going to be just fine. Left, never saw her again. By 8 o'clock that morning, my heart rate stabilized, my blood pressure stabilized, my temperature had gone away. When the doctors made their rounds, they looked at my scars, and they said, incredible. As the words, incredible. You know, you can think about your spirit. You could think about your religion. You could think about what you believe in. You could think about all these different things. But the truth is, it was the unwavering decision. It was the faith. It was the prayers of everyone combined. Regardless of, of what you're related, it was the faith behind it that allowed everything to fall into play. Everything fell in line because of the faith, the determination, because of the, willing, of the unwillingness to let go. That's not where the fight ended, however. See, in my case, I was injured so bad, I was losing so much blood. I had 134 blood transfusions. That's over 17 bodies full of blood. That I had to have a janitor stationed to my room full time because I was losing so much blood that they were mopping it off the floor the whole time. Who could have ever thought of such a thing, right? And every eight hours, they had to take me into a room called the scream room where they would bring me, put me on a metal slab. They would take the iron brushes. They would carve me up. And then they would basically dip me into a tub full of betadine. What's the lesson? The lesson is that we cannot achieve anything or get any types of results in our life if we're not willing to go through the pain. It's not just that we can have this mindset that I can do all things. We have to be willing to go through the pain in order to get to the promised land. And guess what? That pain isn't always easy. Yeah, sure. I mean, I had to have my body cut up. I had to have 134 blood transfusions. My parents had to be willing to go through the pain of watching their son die every single day. You have to be willing to go through the pain. It's not enough to just want something. It's not enough to just have a positive mindset. It's not enough to just show up. You have to show up with the knowledge and the understanding that you're going to have to go through the pain each and every day, each and every minute. And if you do, you're still not guaranteed to get what you want because guess what? Sometimes the pain is just a lesson. Getting you ready for the next step in life. 
so we went through that for months. And at the end of it, on Christmas Day, this is two months later, the D Good Morning America showed up in my room, and they wanted to film me being told that I was going to be allowed to go home. I kicked them out of my room. Okay? <laughs> I didn't want them there. I didn't feel like spending Christmas or being a prop. And, uh, and you know, I'll never forget, oh, this is something else that's interesting. On, 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 I was burned on Halloween, and my fingers were amputated on Friday the 13th. Interesting, right? You know? Um, but when they, when they amputated my hand, a lot of the infection went away. And then on Christmas Day, I was allowed to, uh, I was told that I was going to survive. Um, you know, but that's really where the fight started for me. Because I wasn't willing to live a life that said, okay, everybody would have thought this kid went through all this, that, he survived, that's the accomplishment, that's it. Well, I couldn't do it. That's not in me. I wasn't willing to be the kid who was playing Nintendo in his parents' ba basement that always had, well, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have made it through that. And so what did I do? As a natural instinct, as a 12-year-old boy, I got a little bit angry. Okay? I got a little bit angry any time someone wanted to feel bad for me. I made them feel bad about themselves. I got a little bit angry any time someone wanted to take it easy on me. I went a little bit harder on them. I got a little bit angry because all I didn't survive this accident and go through all this just to live a life that's less than. I went through all this so that I could live a life that is a normal life, that you accomplish things, that you have what you want in your life. And I said to the people when I left the hospital, I said, look, I'm going to play football again. I don't even know if they really believe me. If this was 2016, I'd have never been allowed. But two years later, I was playing strong safety under the lights at Taggart Stadium. And six years later, I was a starter on our varsity team playing outside linebacker. Had seven and a half sacks my senior year, led the conference. Um, and it just showed me everyone else thought this was a big deal. It was in the newspaper. I was given awards. I was invited to speak at places. I, but to me, it was just normal. And here's why. See, once you make the commitment and understand how to overcome one obstacle, you now possess the knowledge and the strength to overcome all obstacles. Once you develop the mindset and achieve something and you indoctrinate a belief and you allow what is in you to guide you, no longer are you reliant upon what other people say your limits are. Now, when you live a life like that, now what other people say your limits are no longer matter. That's why it was no big deal when I got back on the football field. That's why my objective on the football field was to be a leader and tell everyone what was going on, to make the big play when no one else could. Because I knew that I could make that big play. That's why. And the beauty of this is it's, it's so, so simple. At 12 years old, you would have never thought for a moment, not for an instant, that I could overcome that accident. Would you think that you could overcome that accident today? But the truth is, just as I did, you could. See, we all possess an inherent strength within us to achieve, to do more, to lead, to learn, to make the right decisions, to manage and to follow. And when you take these situations, this adversity that I went through, and you understand that it applies to your life. 
It applies to your desires. It applies to this company. It applies to your jobs. It applies to every conversation that you have every single day. When you allow that to really sink in and, and really permeate who you are, there's some people that you cannot say anything to that is ever going to adopt a belief system, and there's other people that you don't have to say anything to because they have the right belief system. The point is, it's true. We all go through hurt in our life. We have all gone through disappointment in our lives. We've all had disappointing relationships. We've all had disappointing circumstances in our jobs. We've all studied for a test and not done as well as we were supposed to. We've all had setbacks. It's how we respond to the setbacks. It's how quick we are at acknowledging the next step. This is just an example. Okay, what I find very interesting about today is, is twofold. And I was telling Scott this a little bit ago. A year ago, I was the CEO of a large national supplement company. Well, today was the day, this day, I was speaking at, in Columbus, Ohio with Antonio Brown. It was the day my partnership failed. Me and my partner just couldn't get along anymore. Today, and guess what? It caused a lot of turmoil in my life. Turmoil that a lot of businessmen wouldn't have made it through. But guess what? One year later, Scott saw me. We spoke every week. He saw me dig myself out of the doldrum and get back. It's very, very interesting because you are not a product of your circumstance. What you are is a product of how you respond to it. That's what life is all about. That's what things are all about. I mean, see, see, in every conversation in business and in life, you're going to have difficult people. You're going to have difficult customers. You're going to have difficult situations. But how are you responding? You know, I've taken this accident, I've taken this, and I wasn't the best student in high school. I graduated with a 2.3 grade point average from high school. But I went on to college. And I wasn't the greatest at college either, my freshman year. I had about a 2.0 grade point average. So I left college, and I started studying business. I read a book named Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, it really changed my life. I went to see Tony Robbins, uh, Unleash the Power Within in 1997. And I really, I went to see Zig Ziglar's and I went to really study and see, I was on a mission in my late, in my early 20s to figure out why did this happen to me? That's all I was trying to figure out is why. Why did this happen to me? What is it, why? And as I studied Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar's and all the other Jim Rome, if I studied everything and, and learned about thinking and growing rich, I was never able to figure out why. But I was able to figure out how. See, and the how was so important. So, so what happened is very simple. I was able to figure out how. This is number one. Something bad happened. Okay? Something bad happened. Number two. Denial. See, the denial phase was after I was burned, I was still asking if I could play football that night, right? I denied the, uh, the idea. But number three is I accepted it. And only through accepting what happened, number four, I became angry.
And that anger fueled my growth and recovery. Now, this isn't exactly the five stages of overcoming grief, but this is what I identified as the process that I went through that you should take with you, okay? Because it doesn't have to be that something bad happens. It could be that we see a problem, okay? It doesn't have to be that we're in denial of that problem. It could be that we are searching for solutions. It doesn't have to be that you just accept the problem. It could be that you found a solution. You don't have to get angry. You could get focused. And once you get focused, you could use what you just learned in your business to grow and prosper. See, this is really what happened to me. This is why I say when people ask me, okay, what happened, I say, well, this is like the biggest blessing that I've ever had. Because I've used this exact strategy to, yeah, I, was a, I wasn't a great student, but once I learned this, I went back to school and I was on the dean's list every single semester my last three years of school. Got a degree in finance. After that, I started working at H&R Block making $7.25 an hour. It's pretty cool, huh? Well, what I learned is that no one in there knew what they were doing, so to speak, okay? And so as a young kid, I said, I'm going to go get a master's degree. And I went and enrolled in a master's in taxation program, not knowing what I was going to get into. And pretty soon, I, I graduated with a master's in taxation in one of the top three in my class. When I took the exit exams from Robert Morris University, there was 800 kids that we graduated with. I finished number eight on my exit exam. I then uh, went to become a certified public accountant without an accounting degree. I had a finance degree and a master's in taxation. And I finished in the top 5% of all CPA testing in the country. And it was just simply by utilizing this strategy. It was by utilizing what I learned in overcoming this adversity. See, but as entrepreneurs then, we have to temper ourselves because after I did this, I started my own firm. I started buying real estate. I took a $6,000 that I borrowed and I went to free and clear tax sales. And so far, I've turned that $6,000 into over $315,000 cash by researching, by buying, by flipping. Then I took my CPA practice and said, well, this is great. We do a lot of tax returns, but what can we do now? So I got licensed as an insurance agent, started doing life and annuity services. I got licensed with uh, Charles Schwab and started doing investment advisory services. And now we have over 1,300 clients that we provide all these robust services for. I ended up starting a minor league football team in 2006 and quickly was the CFO of the, of the national organization in the North American Football League. Had 114 teams across the country. Newcastle Thunder was the name of my organization. Boy, was that a political fight to just get a stadium. We did it for three years and it was a great experience, but we were number one in the country for nine weeks in a row in 2008. And I coached the team, I led the team, I did everything by basically utilizing this strategy. See, so it doesn't take, and, and 
a year ago when, when Scott and I were in, uh, in West Palm Beach. We all had to write a letter to ourselves. Okay? We had to write a letter to ourselves, which was going to get mailed to us back a year later. Well, within this time, I was the CEO of a company that was, we were depositing $250,000 a week. We were doing fantastic, had a big partner blowout. You know, our company ends up, you know, going down the tubes. And I went through a terrible, terrible time. But I responded by utilizing this. Now, was it easy? Absolutely not. But at the same time, it sharpens your saw. So in January, when I received the letter, and this is so interesting because my friend Rana here and Scott, you would have thought that they were talking. They both called me at the same time. In November, we started chatting. And they both said, Anthony, you need to be speaking to people. You need to share your story. You know, that, that's the truth. And that's kind of what led to today. But I get this, I get this letter in the mail. And I read the letter. And boy, if you ever go to a Tony Robbins event, you know, he activates different parts of your brain that you never really saw before. And I wrote myself a letter that said that I have been the light that comes into dark places. And I need to take my light and shine it upon all the people that I can so that they can then use that light, not only in dark places, but also to make their lives better, their businesses better, and to brighten the futures of others. And see, now I feel like today talking with you and being here is giving you an opportunity to see the light so that you could have a better opportunity so that you may use it when you're faced with adversity, so that you can focus and use a very simple strategy to get what it is that you want in life. I couldn't be more excited to be here and share my story with you today. It's been a tremendous experience, and I'm just going to part with you on this. You know, we're faced with things in our lives that we cannot understand the purpose behind. It's always going to happen. But the reason that we're going through the things that we're going through today are to prepare us for things that we have to deal with tomorrow. See, the first day that I was home from the hospital, we had some serious, serious challenges, okay? I had to learn how to take a bath. I could barely walk. I had to learn how to get dressed. It was my mother's birthday, 1988, and after the bath, she had to put me on the ground, and it was time for her to put my dressings on, okay? And you had this whole process. Well, after that was done, it was time to put this pressure garment on me so that it would reduce my scarring. And we could not get it on. And although I never cried in the hospital, at that minute, I felt bad for myself and I began to cry. When I began to cry, my mom stood up before me and cracked me in the face just as she cracked Dr. Slater. And she looked at me and she said, you are not allowed to feel bad for yourself. You are never to feel bad for yourself. Do not feel bad for yourself. Well, I got ticked, okay? And wouldn't you know, I told her I don't want any of your help. I put the whole suit on myself, got dressed, called my dad, had him pick me up. I couldn't believe she smacked me in the face. Well, I'm convinced that if I didn't get smacked in the face that day, I'd have lived my life feeling bad for myself. Which is nowhere that you ever want to be. So I challenge you this. 
Don't feel bad for yourself. Quit feeling bad for yourself. If a manager says something that bothers you, don't feel bad about it. If an employee does something that they shouldn't have done, don't feel bad for yourself. Quit. Get out from under the guise that you're not the best. This group right here is the greatest group in the world at doing what you do. It's either you're going to believe that internally or you're going to fall circumstance to the people who you're competing with that already have that belief system in themselves. Quit feeling bad. Quit putting limitations on yourself. Quit it right now. Decide that today is the day. This is the difference. This is the fulcrum for the rest of time. We can do this. Focus on that. Become that. Believe it because it's true. And you're going to have everything you ever wanted in your life. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.